All right, let's say a few more things about um, modules and then move on to Noetherian rings. So we say that M, okay, so if M is an A module, of course, A is a commutative ring, blah, 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 everything you need to know. Okay, so if M is an A module, then these three things are equivalent. We have M being equal to zero, then Localizing at P gives you the zero ring for every proper prime ideal A. So remember here, when we localize at P, that means that we're taking S inverse M, where we use our set S as A set minus P. Um, and this whole, this is equivalent to the same thing, but instead of considering proper prime ideals, we consider maximal ideals. Um, and so two of these things are really easy. A implies that should be a B. Um, but I mean, what, what am I doing here? This should be A implies B. This should be B implies C. I don't, I don't know what was going through my head. Um, I can tell you one thing, it wasn't correct, but so, this is obvious because if you have a zero ring and you divide by stuff, all the things you divide by are going to be zero elements. So if you take the ring of fractions of the zero ring, you're going to get the zero ring. So if this is zero, then this is going to be zero for every, for every prime ideal. Um, so that's obvious. B implies C is obvious too because we know that prime ideals are maximal ideals. No. Yes, no. Maximal ideals are prime. So, yeah, like, like I wrote here. So, if you have a maximal ideal, then, well, obviously it's proper as well, because that's part of the definition of a maximal ideal, but we've proven that maximal ideals are prime. So, if B holds, then C holds as well, because maximal ideals are prime. And so the only thing that really takes any amount of work is that C implies A. So... If you, local, if you get the zero ring by localizing at every single maximal ideal M, we want to prove that we started out with the zero module. Was I saying zero ring? I hope not. These are, oh, yeah, I said zero ring a whole bunch. These are all modules. Sorry about that. M is a module. M sub P is a module. And S, so this is an A module. These are all S inverse A modules. These are all S inverse A modules. Okay. So for C implies A, um, suppose that localizing the module at M will give you the zero module for every single maximal ideal M of A. And we assume for contradiction that this, um, that the M that we started with is not the zero module. And that means that there must be some element X which is in a non-zero element of M. Now we define, I guess this could use its its own separate definition because this actually comes up a lot not so much in this class but just like there's a lot of um like if you go deeper into ring theory and deeper into um like if you sol try to solve like a bunch of exercises there's a lot of stuff that you can prove about this thing this is a really important ideal it's the annihilator of x and it's the elements in a which kind of kill x. So this multiplication here, this is the um, action of a on m because m is an a module. So this is the elements in a such that acting on this element x of the module gives you zero. So obviously, we, so we want to prove it's an ideal. Obviously zero is in there since you apply zero to x, you get zero, always. Um, now suppose we have elements a and b in the annihilator, then that means that if you look, look at this element a plus b, then just distribute it out. It's zero plus zero, which is zero. Um, and this, I realize, I think I messed this up in the last video, um, where I had to prove I had to prove something was an ideal, and I proved like, oh, you take two elements, add them together, it's in the ideal. Multiply them together, it's in the ideal. So therefore, it's an ideal. That doesn't prove it's an ideal. That proves it's a it doesn't necessarily prove it's a submodule, no, or a subring, because in order to be a subring, it would have to have 
the identity. Um, yeah, and if it had the identity and were an ideal, then it would be the whole ring. So um, that, that what I did last video, it, it was I, I should have done more. I should have not just proven that you multiply two things in the um, two things and you multiply two things in the um, I think in that case it was a ring. You multiply two things in the ring and you get no. You multiply two things in the ideal and you get an ideal. But you need you take something in the ideal and you take something that's just in the ring and you stay in the ideal. Um, but here, let's see here. These are um, yeah. So here you take something in the ideal and then you multiply by something in the ring. So, but it doesn't matter here because you take R A times X. Well, this uh, this you can by associativity. Um, because that's kind of involved in the module structure. Um, this is the same as R applied to A of X, and A times X is zero since A is in the, the annihilator, so this is R times zero, which is zero. Therefore, the annihilator is an ideal. Um, now, it's also a proper ideal because X is non-zero and X is one of X, so one does not annihilate x, so one is not in the annihilator. So therefore, our the annihilator is a proper ideal. So one of the things that we proved is that given any ideal, there is a maximal ideal which contains it. Um, I think it was a corollary of the fact that maximal ideals exist, which was in itself a Zorn's lemma argument. So anyways, um, let, and this is just some fancy M, be a maximal ideal which contains the annihilator. Now, by C, localizing at M is zero. Um, so, now X over one is in here because X is in M, and, well, when you localize, you, um, one is not in the, well, yeah, one is always going to be, in the multiplicatively closed set, so you can always divide here. So x over one is zero, but this takes place in the um, in S inverse M. So that means that x over one is equivalent to zero over one. Um, and what does that mean? That means that there exists an element S which is in the multiplicatively closed set S, which here is a set minus M. So this element is such that s times uh, x s times so let's see here s times one applied to x minus one applied to zero is zero, but that's just s applied to x is zero. Okay, so s applied to x is zero, but that means that s is in the annihilator, which is contained in M. Um, so here we said that S is not in M, and here we say that S is in M. This is a contradiction. So therefore, we go all the way back to here, um, where we made the contradiction assumption. Um, so we can conclude that there is no such element X. So there is no non-zero element in M. Therefore, M must be zero. And therefore, A implies B implies C implies A means that A, B, and C are all equivalent. Because you can get from any one of them to the other by just going through the um, implications. Because of the implication. So, let's define a Notherian ring. So, we take a commutative ring and we call it Notherian after Emmy, Nether, no other, Noether. I, don't, I have no idea how to pronounce it. I don't know what nationality it is. Um, so it's Notherian. I'll just, we, I, I typically hear it called that, whether or not that's actually correct. So, it's Notherian if it satisfies the ascending chain condition, which means that if you have any chain of ideals A0 contained in A1, contained in blah, 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 and goes off to infinity, if you have any such chain, then it terminates, i.e., there is some integer greater than or equal to zero such that for every single integer past that one, um, the ideals are going to be the same. So you can get like A0 all the way up through A capital N. And some of these inclusions between zero and capital N, they might be proper, they might be equality. But once you get to A sub capital N, 
from there on out, every inclusion is actually an equality. So there's really only finitely many, only finitely many of these inclusions can be proper. Okay. It turns out there are uh, three equivalent conditions for being Noetherian. And of course, the first one is the ascending chain condition, which we took as the initial, our original definition. Then we've also got this one. Every non-empty set S of ideals has a maximal element. This definition I don't really see used a lot in proofs. Um, so it's not quite as useful. The ascending chain condition, that ends up being... That, that comes up in proofs a lot, so that ends up being useful. But this one is especially useful, actually. Um, uh, particularly in things like the Hilbert basis theorem, which we will get to later. But it's that every ideal is finitely generated. Um, okay, so as some corollaries to this, principal ideal domains are Noetherian because principal ideal domains, every ideal is generated by one element. And in particular, every ideal is finitely generated, and that's equivalent to the ascending chain condition, which is the definition of being Noetherian. Um, another thing, if A and B are commutative rings and there is a ring homomorph, uh, yeah, a ring homomorphism f f from A to B, which is surjective and A is Noetherian. So I guess, uh, this, this, I, I was trying to phrase this, like I, I phrase this weird because I was trying to fit everything in this line. So as is B, if A is, and there is a ring homomorphism F from A to B, which is surjective. And to prove that, what you do is you, uh, you take an ideal in B and consider its inverse image under F, which um, we know to be an ideal in A because we know that uh, inverse images of ideals under ring homomorphisms are also ideals. Okay, so then you get an ideal in A. A is an Otherian, so it's every ideal is finitely generated. So the inverse image of this ideal is um, where are we using surjectivity here? Um, well, anyways, so we um, yeah, we we take this back here, and uh, so we get the the inverse image is um is finitely generated because A is Noetherian. And then you just push forward whatever those finite generators were of the ideal here, you map them under F and those end up being the finite generators of the ideal that you started with in B. And if you want to prove that, that I don't think is very hard um, and that's somehow going to involve surjectivity because otherwise this wouldn't have been stated. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's a fact. That's a corollary of this. But anyway, so let's prove this. So to prove A implies B, um, so we assume the ascending chain condition holds and we suppose that we have a Okay, yeah. So suppose we have a non-empty set S of ideals. So it's not empty, so choose some A0 in there. So if it's a maximal element of S, then we've found that there's a maximal element there. And so that's what we want, and so we're good. If it's not maximal, then A0 is contained in some maximal ideal. We'll call it A1. So there's some A1 in S such that A1 properly contains A0. And then if A1 is maximal, then good, we're done. If not, then A1 is properly contained in some, ma some ideal a2, which is an element of S, and we just keep going and going and going, um, and we continue this process. And if this process never terminates, then we get a, uh, a chain A0 contained in A1, contained in all the way off to infinity, where all of these inclusions are proper. But this contradicts the ascending chain condition, because we have a chain which, in, in this scenario, we have a chain which does not terminate. Therefore, um, it cannot be that this process never terminates, so it does terminate. So eventually you get to some an such that an is a maximal element of s. And this holds for every single set s, so therefore every non-empty set 
S of ideals has a maximal element, and so that's what the proposition of B is. So therefore, if A holds, then so does B. All right, now suppose that B holds, and we want to prove that C holds. So for C, we want every ideal to be finitely generated. So take an ideal A in our Noetherian ring A, and let's construct a non-empty set of ideals. So we'll take S to be the set of finitely generated ideals contained in A. And certainly this is not empty because it contains a zero ideal because the zero ideal is generated by zero, so it's finitely generated. Kind of a dumb example, but it's necessary here. It's actually useful. Um, so anyways, S has some maximal element by B, and we'll call this maximal element M. And well, if every ideal is final, if we want to prove that every ideal is finitely generated, then this maximal element M, it better be the ideal we started with, A. So assume for contradiction that it's not A. If it's not A, then because M is contained in A, there must be some element in A set minus M. But now consider the ideal generated by M and A. This is, um, so M is a maximal element of the, of the set of finitely generated ideals. So M is finitely generated. So if you just take, take the finite generators here and then just add one more generator, it's the ideal that you end up with is also finitely generated. So this is an S, but it properly contains M, which contradicts the fact that M is a maximal element of S. Um, so therefore, it cannot be the case that M is not A, and therefore M is A, and therefore A is finitely generated. This holds for any ideal A of, of capital A, and therefore um, every ideal is finitely generated, so B implies C. Lastly, we want C implies A, so suppose every ideal is finitely generated, and take some ascending chain A0 contained in A1 off to infinity, now take their union. This is an ideal, I forget if we've proven this, just in case, let's prove it. So it contains zero, because zero is in every single AI, so it's an A, because A is the union. And now let's take A and B in A, then there must be some, A and B are in this union, so they must be in, each one must be in some AI. So there exists indices i and j, and we'll assume without loss of generality that i is less than or equal to j, such that a is in ai, which by this ordering is contained in aj because this is an ascending chain, and also we have b in aj. So if you add them together, these two are elements in aj, and aj is an ideal, so adding them together gives you an element of aj, which is contained in a, um, and then you multiply anything in a by in any element in the ring, and because a is an AI and AI is an ideal, then this is an AI which is an A, so therefore A is an ideal. Okay, so we have an ideal given by taking the union, but by C, every ideal is finitely generated. So A is finitely generated, say by elements A1 through AN. Each of these AIs must be contained in one of these ideals in the chain. So for each I, there is some index MI such that AI is contained in fancy A sub MI. And now you just take your, um, the, the, the terminating index here to be the maximum of M1 through Mn. And then, um, so if you let N be this index, then, um, for, then, then, then An is equal to A. So for everything past An, all of these inclusions are equality signs. And so the thing terminates. And so the ascending chain condition holds. And so C implies A, therefore A implies B implies C implies A, and so the three are equivalent, and so these are all equivalent conditions. All right, and then after that we'll talk about more things involving Noetherian rings and Noetherian modules and eventually the Hilbert basis theorem.